Hello. Hello. So I did ask, and I was told that there might be a few people that are educators or teachers here. Is that correct? Because don't judge me on my teaching. <laughs> I will try. But um, so, so what do you teach? Uh, I do behavior modification and uh, pre-employment. Oh, okay. But I'm just glad you don't do high school science. <laughs> because uh, a lot of what I'm going to... Oh, you do. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Elementary? Okay. Well, this is probably a little bit higher up than elementary. But this is probably in somebody who said, have you done this before? And I go, yeah, but I think it's been a while. Uh, but this should look kind of familiar with maybe what some people might have studied back in high school in a science class. And it's been a while, I know. It doesn't look like I've been out of high school that long, but I have. But um, what I'm going to do is go through some of the fundamentals so everybody has a basic understanding of atomic structure. These are the things you learned in high school. So then with that foundation, we can understand where does radiation come from, and then also um, how, what risks are associated with it. But you really got to understand from the very beginning, it starts with the atom. Am I am I doing the slides? Doing this? Yes. If you need help, let me know. Uh, there we go. Is that the title? Fundamentals of ionizing radiation. We'll talk later about the difference between ionizing and non-radiation. But this is all about ionizing radiation, and that's what we are concerned with in the protection of health physics. So it all starts with the atom, and. Most people, no matter how long they've been out of high school science, remember that you have a nucleus that's made up of neutrons and protons, and then you have electrons circling in the orbits outside the nucleus. Atoms are the building block of all matter. So what happens is you have a nucleus, and this actually is pretty uh, good schematic to show how large the neutrons and protons are in relationship to the electrons, the orbiting. So, uh, and even the mass. So neutrons and protons have, although it's very uh, atomic mass, it's very small, but compared to the electron, the little red guy out there in the circle, it's much larger than electrons. And that is gonna be very important as we continue to go forward to understand mass and the, nucle the neutrons that might come out of the nucleus and why that mass is important to understand. So the, nucle the nucleus and nu nuclear materials become our, the founding blocks for the atoms. Similar atoms can form elements. So for instance, you can have two atoms and then you have uh, a hydrogen element, helium, so forth. Elements combine to form molecules. So you have hydrogen and oxygen that becomes the molecule of water. And then you have lots of different molecules that could form compounds. Uh-oh. There we go. Okay. This is kind of fundamental and a basic that we have to understand, so there we understand radiation. <coughs> so the number of protons define the element. So if you have five protons, five protons, five protons, always going to be the same element. However, if the number of neutrons differ, then it's an isotope of that same element. Okay, and I'll show an example. In a little bit. So the isotopes of an element, and they're all going to have the same chemical properties. You aren't going to be able to distinguish them. So, for instance, this is hydrogen. And the reason I like to show hydrogen is because as members of this board, sometimes you're gonna have presentations on our underground test area, and the isotope of concern is tritium, okay? And notice I said isotope, but the element is hydrogen. So tritium is an isotope of the element hydrogen, okay? So if you look at this, normal hydrogen has one proton, one electron. And see, if you look at the nucleus, they all have the same number of protons. And remember what I said? The number of protons, they're all the same. Then that's the same element. However, as you can see, the number of neutrons differ. So when you have one neutron, it's called deuterium. 
And then if you have two neutrons, it's called tritium. So essentially, tritium is an isotope of hydrogen, and the difference between it is the number of neutrons. However, if you had a hydrogen, normal hydrogen, and you had a tritium hydrogen atom, chemically they would be the same. You would not be able to separate them. So that's very important. So if you end up combine, having it combined with oxygen, and you have a water molecule, one with hydrogen and one with the tritium, you would not be able to distinguish it from a chemical perspective. It's going to behave the same. And that's where sometimes it's referred to as heavy water. Heavy because it's heavier because it has those two neutrons. Okay? So, this is the notation. Uh, so as you can see, the X is always the symbol of the element. The Z number is the number of protons. So if you look up in the corner, and the atomic mass is the number of protons and neutrons. So, for instance, if we took tritium, the X would be an H. The Z number is the atomic number, so it'd be three, because remember it had th two neutrons and one proton, and then the atomic number would be the number of protons, which is one. Okay? So, what is ionizing radiation? So in a world, we are totally surrounded by radiation. And it can be, um, when it doesn't have, a, it's very low energy, you can have radar waves, microwaves, laser, visible light. That is all known as non-ionizing radiation. Here's the electronic spectrum. So as, uh, the, some of the ones I've mentioned it, as non-ionizing, they're usually very low frequency and large waves. Whereas when you get down to the ionizing radiation, like x-rays and gamma rays, high frequency, high energy, and very short waves. So, what is unique about ionizing and the, the distinction between non-ionizing, it has enough energy to knock electron out of the orbit. So this is a good schematic, and so what could happen if we go way back to these, you always have the same number of electrons as you do protons. Electrons have a negative charge, protons have a positive. So when you net knock an electron out of the orbit, now you have two what I will call ions. You have a free ion as a negative charge, the electron that got knocked out, right? And you also have an atom now that has a positive charge because now it has more protons than it does electrons. So then that's what's called ionizing radiation. And typically what it means, it's been ionized. It now has either a negative or a positive charge. So. The nucleus can either be stable or unstable. Rule of thumb, the stability of a nucleus is generally related to the how heavy of element it is. So if you look at the periodic table, the periodic chart, as you go further, and usually what they call transuranics, those that are beyond uranium, are typically always unstable heavier elements. Not always, but general, those all are, but generally rule of thumb, thumb, that's usually how it is. So essentially what's happened, stable nu nucleus, they have the right number of protons, the right number of neutrons, and right number of electrons, and they're just happy. They're stable. They're okay with their state, if you will. But an unstable nu nucleus typically could have too many neutrons, too many protons. They might have, um, electrons might have been knocked out of the same, so it's not happy in its state. It therefore, is unstable. And so, as an unstable nucleus, it's trying to figure out how can I get stable. And essentially, stability is typically defined by having about the same number of neutrons and protons in that nucleus. So, to become stable, there's ways it might it might emit what they call an alpha particle, which essentially 
two neutrons and two protons being ejected out of the nucleus. A beta particle, where a neutron ejects actually what's like an electron, but it's coming out of the neutron, not the orbit. And so then it becomes a proton. But that beta particle is then free, and it's kind of like a free electron, although its origin is from the nucleus. That's why it's not called an electron, but it's actually called a beta particle, and it has a minus one charge. Positons, neutrons, we're not going to get into that because really on the board, what we're going to usually deal with is alpha, beta, and then also this gamma radiation. So if you remember, if we go back to the spectrum, the very end are these gamma rays, which are essentially a lot, or, or just like x-rays. The difference is the origin. So when you go get an x-ray, a gamma ray is very similar to the characteristics of an x-ray. The difference is the origin. So they're usually high energy and short waves. And they typically can accommodate so, for instance, when the neutron ejects the electron, the beta particle, a lot of times there's some excess energy with that, and what that is is gamma rays, which is comparable to X-rays. Okay, and then I'm not going to really talk about the other two because what we're going to um, have a, hopefully a foundation is an understanding of gamma radiation, beta radiation, and alpha radiation. Because as you serve on this board, we're going to talk about different isotopes and how they become stable through which process? Through alpha emissions, beta emissions, or gamma rays. Okay, so uh, right there, the alpha particle, remember I said it's essentially two neutrons and two protons. And because it emitted both neutrons and uh, and uh, neutrons and protons, it changes the element. Remember, because you no longer have the same number of protons, so it's no longer the same element. And the mass is different because you've also used lost uh, protons. So with that, as you can see, if you had a thorium-231 and it's radioactive and it emits an alpha particle, then what happens, oh, I'm sorry, the, the, um, I went the opposite way. So if you have a U-235 and it emits an alpha particle, then it is going to lose and it's going to become thorium-231. That's called a decay chain, a decay series. So sometimes you're going to end up with a new element and sometimes you're not. But here, because it's a very, very heavy on a molecular uh, scale, very heavy. Two alpha an alpha particle with two neutrons and two protons are, is very heavy. And so that can also, that can actually create a lot of ionizing to take place if it was to come into contact with living tissue. So that's why we say it's a highly charged particle. It's got two, a charge of two, it's heavy. And because it's heavy, if it was in your body, it's not going to travel very far. So the damage is going to be more localized as well. But the good news is it can be shielded as easily with a piece of paper. So if we had a bunch of, uh, let's say we had um, americium-241 right here, and it, elects, it emits electron, I mean uh, alpha particles, we're generally safe because our skin, our clothing, it's not going to travel very far, so it's really not an external risk to have if, it was, if we had an alpha source right here. However, if it does get inside the body, then it uh, can be very hazardous, and that's why we say it's an internal hazard. So a lot of th times, that's, why, that's when you might wear respirators. That's why there's protection to make sure that when you're dealing with isotopes that um, decay through the alpha, process that we try to ensure that the people do not have a <coughs> opportunity for an internal exposure. And I don't know if I covered it later, but I will say, so this is some of the things that are more associated with our soil sites. So when we do remediation of soil sites, 
we have some that are alpha emitters. Okay? Keep that in mind. So beta particles, as I said earlier, uh, next, this is just where the nucleus ejects a beta particle, so that neutron now becomes a proton. And with that, you get a beta particle, and you also get some extra energy, almost in, in the form of antineutrinos, and you also antineutrinos, and also um, gamma rays. So as you can see, um, it changes. Um, from one isotope to another. So in the case of tritium, so tritium, and I think I mentioned this, is um, common in the UGTA because we know that we have tritium that's being released because it acts like water. It decays by a beta particle. And so if we looked at what that looks like, the H3, the tritium, releases a neutron and it actually becomes helium. So that would probably have been a better example than the calcium than the potassium because it's really what is important to your work on the NSAB. So there's small negative charge particles. So it has a charge of one. It goes a little bit further than your alpha particle because it's not as heavy. So it takes a little bit um, more shielding, but it can still be shielded by plastic, glass, metal foil, or safety glasses. So a lot of times, if you're dealing with tritium, uh, you might have safety glasses, uh, you might have anti-seas, because the important thing is, is never allow the beta particles, uh, you can shield them with a pair of safety glasses. So it's considered uh, an, inhalation, an in internal hazard through inhalation and ingestion. And like I said before, that's why we might wear um, glasses because it will shield your eyes and also the skin could cause beta burns. So as long as you're working with beta particles and you have proper clothing on, shielding mainly the eyes and skin, it's generally not considered an external hazard. It's only the ingestion of it. Gamma rays, and as I mentioned, these, these typically are accompanied beta particles. And so you do not see a, a charge with them, so it's not a charged particle, it's just high energy. So because it's high energy, like electronic, electromagnetic waves, like I showed you on the spectrum, they have no charge, similar to x-rays, depending on the isotope and the energy of the gamma ray, it depends on how far it can travel. Some are very low energy, some are very high energy. So it depends on how much shielding, but typically lead is used a lot as a good shield. So anything that has a high Z number typically is a good shield. And the biological hazard is whole body because it's going to go through you because it can penetrate because of high energy. Neutron I'm really not going to go into because it's something that is not unless you're in the operation side, but for remediation, we don't really have to deal with any hazards of neutron for any of our remedi remedi remediation sites. Okay, so that's the basic. So does everybody kind of have a good basic and foundation of the difference between alpha, beta, and gamma? Okay, so half-life is very important. Half-life is a signature for the radioisotope. So the isotope that is actually radioactive all have a unique half-life. So tritium is a just a little over 12 years. So that means whatever the amount of tritium you have in 12 years, it's going to be half of that original amount. So let's say we had a thousand, and I'm just going to not put a unit in, but a thousand tritium atoms. It goes through one half-life of 12 years, you now have 500. In another 12 years, you have 250. Rule of thumb is about 7 to 10 half-lives. It's essentially now stable. And so you no longer would have that radioactive isotope. And for the transuranics that I talked about, 
their half-lives are typically much longer. So you can be in the millions of years for uranium, some of the isotopes of uranium and plutonium. So essentially, you're never going to measure a half-life. <laughs> and for some of those just of interest, that's how a lot of times we date things. You hear carbon dating? That's based on the half-life of carbon. So if we were to have something and we can um, uh, use carbon dating based on the half-life of carbon. So there's half-life, very important, because unlike chemicals, chemicals, once you have a chemical, you always have a chemical. Whereas radioisotopes can actually, through the decay, end up being a stable isotope. Units of measure. This is always the fun one. Because <laughs> usually if everybody has heard up to this point, it's the unit of measurements that kind of might be new. So a Rentkin is only defined by how much radioactivity you have in air. Okay, so somebody might say there's one Rentkin per hour in the air right now. Not very useful, right? Do we really care how much is in the air? What we care about, because it doesn't relate to the biological facts, right? What we care about, what is that one Rentkin in air going to impact my body? So, the next thing they go from there is what's called a radiation absorbed dose. So you take that same amount and say, how much is that going to be absorbed into my tissue? Because then I can start understanding the biological effects. So that unit is then called a radiation absorbed dose. It's pretty good, right? We can get, understand that makes it meaningful. However, it does not take into a, account what type of radiation it is. So remember how I said alpha particles, more localized, can do more damage? So one rad of an alpha particle is not equal to one rad of a beta particle. So that's where the next unit comes in called Rentkin equivalent man. So this is where, um, for the most part, the doses that you will be exposed to now, we're not going to expose you, but when I talk, <laughs> that's the word I'm going to use, is REM. REM clinical limit man. So it takes into account all the energy dose and also the effect it could have on the body because of the type of the radiation. Okay? Nice little chart. Show the difference. And here's the weighting factor. So that shows you alpha the weighting factor is 20 compared to a beta particle. And beta is essentially the same as gamma. So that just shows you a rem, a rad, one rad of a beta particle is equal to 20 rads of alpha. But once you put them into rem, a rem is a rem. Does that make sense? So if I got one rem because it was a beta emitter, one rem because it was alpha, one rem because it was gamma, it's all the same because that has been accounted for through this weighting factor. And this is another hard concept, and I'll be honest with you, it's a hard concept for people in the industry. One rem of external exposure is the same as one rem internal because of the Rankin equivalent man. And even think about it, when you're exposed to gamma, you might feel good thinking, oh, it's just external, it hasn't went internal. Oh, yes, it has, it just went through you. So it might have impacted your critical organs from an external perspective, but the same amount of energy that's transferred because it's internal is equivalent. So when I say I have one rem and I got it through external exposure versus one rem because I ingested some alpha particles, essentially they are the same. And it's a hard concept for most people to appreciate because people, most people say, well, x-ray the crap out of me. I don't care, but I'm not drinking that tritium. 
And I get it, but, but because we don't like what we put into our bodies, right? But really, the idea of what they call the cumulative effective dose takes into account internal, external, so it's all cumulative and additive as the same. And like I said, that's even a hard concept for people that work in the un industry, work with it day to day. So, prefixes. Because one rim is actually a pretty large amount, you usually he will hear millirims. And sometimes microrims. And I bet I never went into p Pico Curies, but that's a whole, I, maybe I'll just briefly talk about that right now. So then when you talk about like tritiated water, you're gonna hear Pico Curies per liter. So the Environmental Protection Agency essentially said, I'm gonna allow from all radionuclides, but if you just look at one in isolation, such as tritium, you can drink enough water that you would get four millirem a year. And that's based on standard man getting all their consumption of drinking water from, let's say, a certain well. So then they say, okay, what does four millirem equate to? And it's essentially about 20,000 picocuries per liter. So when you have a presentation on UGTA, they talk about the Safe Drinking Water Act, they talk about picocuries per liter. Essentially, that picocuries per liter, if you uh, calculate it mathematically, 20,000 would be four millirem. So that's back into a dose instead of uh, how much you're actually taking in. So I'm not gonna talk about the SI units because the United States is about the only one that still uses the millirem, but if you ever read some of the literature and if you go outside of anything in the United States, you're gonna be exposed to the SI unit, just like meters and so that's the milli, the sieverts. Okay? So if you ever want to, you've got this later to look at unit conversions if you see something done in sieverts. Sources of radiation. So every day we are surrounded by radiation. Cosmic, terrestrial, so um, radon, everybody has heard EPA had a big uh, radon, I'll, I'll call it um, awareness, probably in the 80s. And then also the human body. Yeah, we're, we're radioactive. You know, people find that hard to believe, but we have potassium in our body and potassium 40 can be radioactive. So if you've got a lot of high muscle content, you're more likely to be hotter because you might have more potassium 40. So even the human body has some um, radioactivity in it. Cosmic, um, a lot of people have heard the higher up you are. So for instance, uh, we do a lot of, well, that's equivalent to one flight from Las Vegas to New York and back because when you're at a higher elevation, you're exposed to more cosmic radiation. And terrestrial places like um, Brazil, they have high uranium content. Their soils are higher. And actually, way back in um, college, one of the papers I did on the ra is, was on the radioactivity of Brazil nuts. Because they're grown in Brazil, they have high uranium content, and they end up having some alpha component to them. So. And I still eat them. So don't be scared this Christmas season when you see the Brazil nuts on the, on the shelves. Man-made sources. This is huge, medical radiation. If you go back 10 years, we've probably more than doubled how much people are being exposed from medical. I mean, if I, you don't have to, but if I ask for a show of hands, I'd say, how many have had a medical procedure? There's a lot out there. Because the medical industry is using more and more medical procedures that rely on radiation. Nuclear power, believe it or not, that's actually a pretty small component. And I'll show you the chart later. Consumer products, some of your exit signs used to, some of your um, uh, smoke detectors, your thorium mantles when you go camping. Industry and research and other minor sources. So if you look at the average person receives about 620. And I think when I first started giving this presentation, it was around 320. 
And so the 300 has almost all come from the medical industry. And if you look at the bottom, look at one CT scan, just one procedure is 1,000 millirem. So, but if you live near a nuclear power station, it's probably less than one millirem. And later I'm gonna show you, if you live near the Nevada National Security site, it's probably around less than three. And that's only if you eat game animals. I'll show you that later. <laughs> so that gives you a good idea. Natural sources, so the terrestrial, the cosmic, the human body, make up about 310 of that 620 whereas the, the remaining half is from your medical sources. And of course, that's only average, because a lot of people might say, I never get medical sources. And the 310 is average, too, because it could depend on where you live. So there's the nice pie that shows you where it's kind of that in a nice illustration of the pie. And as you can see, the nuclear industry is it showing on there, the industrial, is a small piece of the pie. And another thing that a lot of people don't know, a lot of your um, coal burning actually release more radioactive emissions than nuclear power plants. They're getting cleaner, but in its day. Biological effects of radiation. I know. You really think that the teenage Ninja Turtles got their powers from, from being radioactive, right? Well, unfortunately, science has said, oh, probably not. Um, in fact, I hope sometime they bring in uh, one of the, uh, he used to be in DOE and he's done a lot of low um, dose theories for the Department of Energy. And he essentially says it is hard to do mutations with radiation. It's a really good killer. It can kill a cell, but it usually does not mutate it. So and we'll look at that later. So anyway, I don't have any superpowers. I've been in the industry, wish I did, but I don't. Two categories, and this is significant. So acute and chronic. So acute is a one-time large dose. So back in the day when the science of health physics or radiation protection was just getting started, most of our understanding was based on acute doses. We had Hiroshima, we had, uh, um, even later we had Chernobyl, so we had the atomic bombs. We've even had criticality accidents during trying to understand and develop the bomb. There were several deaths, fatalities in the United States because of criticality accidents. So there was these large acute doses. So. A lot of the standards, still today, are based on extrapolation of acute doses, which is a large one-time dose. So a one large time dose, here's essentially the effects you're going to get. You can kind of say a rad is similar to a, a rim at this point in time. But as you can see, um, about three, 500 rad. 500 gram is when you could actually start seeing mortality. And that's with no supportive care. And the reason I say that, because a lot of times you have an accident, um, you might have bone tra uh, fusion transplants. Uh, remember when the um, Fukushima thing came about and we put, um, they were saying the whole thing about iodine, take it in your thyroid, because then it blocks. If you put non radioactive iodine in your thyroid, you're saturated. So that's the idea. So then one of the radionuclide isotopes of iodine, if you were exposed to it after an accident, you usually don't have thyroid uptake because it's saturated with the non-radioactive isotope. That's how that works. So anyway, so those are the, some of the things that we know from all the data that's out there from the nuclear bombs in Japan, Chernobyl, uh, even some from Three Mile Island, less because there wasn't very much acute exposure, but also the criticality events. So chronic is usually a small amount over a very long period of time. And now that the nuclear industry is much more mature than it was in the beginning when the standards came out, we have a lot more data from all the 
nuclear power plant workers, even in the medical industry. And from the dose we get every day, just naturally. So uh, the standard is based because we have not seen any risk of cancer for those in the occupational exposure, so that you're a radiation worker, to the 5 to the 5,000 milliroom. And this is from a chronic exposure. So if you remember, and I hate that the units are different, but that 500 rad is really like 500,000 milliroom because it's a rad versus a milliroom to do the comparison. So under the Code of Federal Regulations, if you work in the nuclear industry, as a worker, you are allowed to go up to 5 rem or 5,000 millirem a year. And there's no observable radiation effects in humans below a one-time dose of, of 1,000, 10,000, which kind of reiterates what's in that slide. Possible effects of radiation on cells. So you can actually have ionizing radiation come in contact with a cell. Sometimes no damage. Yes, other times the cell repairs itself and then operates normally. Sometimes it's damaged and operate abnormally. A lot of the low dose work that's out there showing that that typically usually doesn't happen. Or it dies of a result of change. And that is really a lot of information we're getting out of oncology is because we know that through radiation therapy, we're cells, cancer cells, we're doing a lot of high dose, and then we're looking at the healthy tissue around it, and what we're seeing is sometimes there's no damage, or it repairs itself and operates normally, or it dies. But we're not seeing a lot of damage and operated abnormally. So a lot of that information is actually coming through a lot of the oncology patients as we use radiation therapy more and more. So the fact is the total dose. Obviously, the larger the dose, the more likely it could be a hazard and a risk. The dose rate, acute versus chronic, type of radiation, alpha, beta, gamma. The area of the body, there's the um, cells that rep reproduce more rapidly tend to be more radiosensitive. And that's why uh, typically in the industry, most workers have to be at least 18, but not above, because the younger people, they still have. And that's why even when you see uh, doses at young children, it's because their cells are more radiosensitive because they're still dividing. And those are more radiosensitive. Cell sensitivity and individual sensitivity, which might be interesting. There's not a lot out there, but they're actually saying some people actually can take more radiation than others. Genetic facts, um, no direct end, uh, there's no evidence of radiation induced effects, genetic effects. Common myth, myth I guess, I'd like to just discount. Comparison, a lot of people say, well, I choose to smoke, I choose to be overweight, I choose to drink, so I'm willing to take that risk, but I don't, I, I don't really choose to be exposed to one rim, but unfortunately uh, this is more for to show how less of a hazard it is than some of the daily bad habits we have. So one rim per year between the age, so you're getting one rim from age 18 to the age 65, it's going to take 51 days off your life. And what a lot of people don't realize is smoking cigarettes, Cigarettes are actually radioactive. They have plutonium, polonium-210 in them. So, Rad protection. So we have this thing in the industry that's called as low as reasonably achievable. And the concept here is the government agent, agency might say the 5,000 millirem that you can expose your occupational workers to However, you always have to consider ALARA. So if you have a low risk and you're 
exposing somebody to the total dose, then you probably say you're not incorporating ALARA, and you would actually could be in violation of the Code of Federal Regulations by not considering ALARA. So three basic principles, time, distance, and shielding. So a lot of the units you'll hear is a rate. So if we went into a room that might have a radioactive source, the radiological control technician might say it's 100 millirem per hour in here. And I go, okay, I only want to make sure you only get 50 millirem to do this job. So then he says, okay, one thing you could do is you have to do it in 30 minutes. And then all of that would be controlled. Or, can't do that. I, it's going to take me an hour. So then there might be some shielding. Can, is there a way we can shield it to lower the dose rate to the 50 millirem per hour? Oh, I'm sorry, the sh that was the shielding example. Or the distance is, is there a way you can be further away? So let's say you have to work on something, and then can you remove yourself? So you distance yourself from the source. So time, like I talked about, spend less time, then you could reduce your dose that way. There's just the example kind of that I gave. Distance, remember how I said it's all about energy? So the further you distance yourself from a source and the less energy it's going to have to reach and cause an exposure. And shielding. So those are the basics. Kind of like this cartoon. So, you know, most times if you've had some medical, the operator is always in a nice shielded room. And so they're protected. But I like this. So if, but if you can't be in the booth, Stand behind the doctor <laughs> because he will provide you some level of shielding. Okay, annual dose limits. So for an occupational worker, and that's somebody that actually works in the industry, they've been trained on the hazards, the aspects of radiation safety, they can receive 5,000 millirem a year, 5 rem. Annual limit to the member of the public is 100. And remember what I talked about, this is cumulative. So it could be from either internal or external sources. It's all cumulative and that's your standard. And I kind of like to put this in perspective. So the annual limit for public is 100. But remember that the average background, you're already getting 620. So it's a fairly insignificant amount considered what we have been exposed to just naturally by being on Earth. So Lara is the idea is that we always look to can you do it? We try to do no radiation exposure without an equal benefit. And also some of the things we could do look at Lara is if you're going to be in there and you're going to be in a respirator, um, but you're going to have to be there longer, would it be easier to take the respirator off and have some internal dose at external so your cumulative is less? So there's even certain things like that that the radiation protection engineer would look at from an Alara perspective. This, I don't know, you know, I think I saw the summary. Somebody had the summary of the annual site environmental report. They all, they all do. This is an amazing report, and the summary is very readable. But this actually came from Chapter 9, and so this is how the Nevada National Security Site every year has to report the previous year dose to show compliance with that 100 millirem. And you have to look at what we call all pathways. So one of the limits is actually under the NESHAPs, under the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, that essentially says you cannot expose the nearest public exposed individual more than 10 millirem a year. So we have to evaluate and look at that. Also, we have to look at our waste management areas and also our environmental remediation areas. And it essentially says that you can have to ensure that the public does not exceed more than 25 millirem per year from those sources. And then, of course, you have the limit that I talked about was 100. And then you also look at biota dose. So we also have to look at, uh, we had a huge accelerator that generated very high energy gamma rays and we um, used it outside. 
So we had to look at all the surrounding plants and ensure that we were below the 0.1 rad per day for our biota dose. So all of this adds up and rolls up into that 100 millirem. Okay, so these aren't individual. So you can't have 10 for air, 25 from that, oh, and you get 100. It all rolls up into the 100 from all pathways. So that 100 has to look at all those pathways. So there we go. So from the Nevada National Security site, because we are so, so remote, the gamma exposure, so for instance, when we have um, truck shipments that might have some gamma exposure from them, it's so remote, general public <coughs> from that the site is a zero. You're not gonna see any gamma exposure. We also have to look at uh, drinking water. Is this on here somewhere? Yeah, no. The drinking water, so um, under our UGTA, as you're going to be on this board, you'll be more and more exposed to the work they're doing. The groundwater pathway is not a pathway that leads to a public drinking water source. So the groundwater pathway is zero. Air emissions, however, we do have some air emissions that we calculate to offsite. And then the other one, oh, there we go, the little bunny. So because of our soil sites, and because of the contamination in the soil, we do, and also when we have um, UGTA uh, that has to go out and pump water out to do sampling, we have huge sumps, those become a water source for game animals, or for any animals for that matter. And so we also have to look at human consumption if game animals were to get off site and the consumption of those. Is it all rolled up into here? So there we go. So in looking at that, um, the little red sliver is 2.91 millirem. This was from 2015, and the majority of it, it's not broke down in here, is actually the consumption of game animals. So we have a little bit of air emissions, but we do have some game animals that we knew primarily have used tritium drinking water sources, and so if they were to get off site, and a hunter consume them, two, we're looking at less than three millirem from the dose from our operations. And that is the interesting, and it's all in chapter nine if you guys want to look at that, or it's probably in the summary as well of how we look at the dose to the general public based on all those pathways. 10 minutes early. So I guess I can open it up for questions or Knowledge level went up a little bit. So as a quick wrap up, um, on the NSAB, when uh, the scientists come and present to you soil, a lot of the soil sites you're gonna hear, these might be uh, plutonium, americium. Those are generally looked at as alpha sources, but they also have some gamma, gamma. So they have to look at it from an external and an internal to look at that 25 millirem dose, which they're allowed to do per site. UGTA, the underground test area, I just lost, did I, oh no, is uh, tr tritium, that's the isotope of concern at this time, mainly because like I said, it behaves like water, and a lot of the other radionuclides are captured, they're vitrified, and they're still at uh, the source of the uh, nuclear device when it exploded. But the water, but tritium, because it behaves like water, if it comes in contact, the tritium has uh, a mechanism, if you will, to be transported. That's tritium. Remember, that's a beta emitter with about a half-life of 12 years, which is really important. And this, it's all driven, that one, not by the DOE limits, but the Safe Drinking Water Act, which is 4 millirem, which is essentially 20 picocuries per liter of tritium. And it would be a different amount if the isotopes changed. Good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, does anybody have questions for Catherine? She's going to stay with us this evening. If you have any other radiation questions, she's going to stay for the briefing. But 
Um, I really want to thank you for being here, and I hope we can show her some appreciation as well. Thank you.